Ladies and gentlemen, this is a picture of a fuel gauge. I'm sure all of you have seen one of these in our daily drives. We drive our cars, uh, we fill up our tanks and we see these. And we keep a keen eye on our fuel tanks. We calculate the amount of fuel we put in, we calculate the amount of money we spend on it, and we also calculate the mileage our cars give. I am also sure that all of you, at least some of us, I don't know if there are exceptionally rich people around, but we try to run to the filling station as soon as we hear about a fuel price increase, and we try to fill up our tanks just before the prices increase, right before the clock touches 12. But the question is, why have we come to conceptualize uh, fuel or fossil fuels as something of a strategic good, as something that inherently drives our everyday lives as something that is a strategic part of our economic and social systems. One of the reasons is that is the way we've taught ourselves to think. And we've embedded that cost that we associate to all forms of energy, especially fossil fuels, into our ways of thinking. But what if I was to tell you that we've been very wrong for the last couple of decades, and we've actually missed the most important resource we have, and we've totally forgotten about it. Ladies and gentlemen, that resource is um, water. Water is the most essential component of our lives. And the reason we've missed it, because we as individuals and collectively as a society, we deal with our pertinent problems in a very unique way. What we do is, uh, what we do is that we deal with our problems on a short-term basis. We never look towards our problems on a long-term basis, and we usually take the sustainability component out of our decision-making processes. Interestingly, even our democracies are running on short leases of five years or six years or four-year terms, and many countries in the world work their systems around that. And because of that, we've conceptualized water as something that we will always have. Uh, let's take a step back and talk about how society was organized before we lived in these huge urbanized societies. Our forefathers used to live in rural setups uh, before the agra uh, agrarian revolution, um, and they used to, they had to walk for miles to grab their share of water for the use of the day. They grew crops in which water was essential component, and if there were drought conditions or less rain, it would directly impact their livelihoods. But over the last two centuries or so, especially more pronounced after the Second World War, we moved towards a phase where essentially we moved in urban communities. We urbanized ourselves, we moved into these huge cities, we shifted into built environments and houses. Now all we have to do is turn the tap on or flick the switch and we get our fair share of water for our daily needs, or industries get their water supply, or we have huge systems of agricultural canals linked to dams, and the agriculture gets its supply as well. What that has done is, that has disconnected us from nature as at one end, and from water as a source of life on the other. And this is the most crucial thing. So I want you to think in terms of attitudes and psychology for water that we've developed ourselves. We've taken it for granted, we think it will always be available, and we also assume that it will be available for free. Uh, before we move on and build that thought process out, I'd like to show something to you which shows what sort of a critical point the global community stands today in terms of our water scarcity. So, by 2025, global water withdrawal will have increased by 18% in the developing world and nearly 50% in the developed countries. At the same time, our population will have jumped by 2050 to 9.3 billion. But keeping both these graphs in mind, you need to know that our water resources will have remained constant at 200,000 cubic kilometers, which is the figure now and which will stay the same in 2050. In fact, it will have reduced to some extent because we pollute quite a lot of our water resources. Whether that is freshwater canals or rivers or seas, we do end up polluting them. The question is, our pool of water is not increasing, our population is increasing, our withdrawal rates and uses are increasing. Are we actually doing something about it? 
A more localized example is Pakistan is one of the most water scarce countries in the world right now. Water is one of the most serious uh, problems this country is facing and will face. In fact, authors around the world and people who've researched on the area have termed water scarcity and climate change as the most major threat for this country in the next couple of decades, rather than terrorism or, uh, or crime or political instability. Because the, the idea is that the rest of the problems are political and you still can solve them in a relatively short span of time if you put enough effort. But water, climate, environment and the ecology are something that are long-run sustainability issues that you cannot solve in a single day. Let me give you the example of Karachi. Karachi is facing an extreme water shortage at this moment in time. By 2050, Karachi's water supply, uh, the, the total amount of water available, will be nearly 545 uh, cubic meters. Um, and the United Nations estimates that you need about 1,000 cubic meters to actually call yourself above the water scarcity line. So that's the threshold for them. So you can see where we are walking and that we've not done anything. But the question is, from my point of view, no amount of policy interventions, no amount of huge dams, small dams, canals, waterworks, water supply schemes, conservation methods, or strategies by the government can work until the point the people, that is us, and we as a society change our attitudes towards water and start thinking of it as a resource that has been provided to us by nature and will be gone if we keep misusing it the way we are misusing it. My object today is not to tell you about what the government should do or not. My object today is to nudge you into thinking so that the next time you see the bottle that you're holding in your hands, you take a shower or you water your garden or you use water for any other purpose, you think of long-term issues, you think of the costs that are associated with the use of water, and you think in a long-run perspective for the next century and for the future generation. Ladies and gentlemen, there are two things that, that we will have to do on our level, which we can all do, rather than blaming uh, the, the multilateral agencies or the government or all other bodies. The first is we need to start associating a cost with water, the amount of water we use. The cost necessarily does not have to be in rupees or dollars. I'm not saying that we have to think in terms of currency. The most important cost is opportunity cost. The opportunity cost of us using water today for the generations that are to come after us, 50 years down the road, 100 years down the road, they will be the generations who will pay for the misuse of water which we are doing today. And that is something which we have to keep into mind when we use water in our homes. So once we embed this sort of thinking into our uh, cognitive systems, once we start teaching our children these sorts of narratives, once we embed this narrative into early childhood education and we teach our children in schools of the importance of not just water, but other natural resources and of the ecological systems around them, that is one real change will be enacted. The second most major thing that we can, can do as, uh, as a society, as a civilization, is to use nudging. We need to start nudging ourselves. Uh, and we need to start changing our default options. We assume by default that water is something of a free resource it will always be available. All I need to do is open the refrigerator or the tap and I will have water. No, that default needs to be changed and it will start with us, the people in this room, the people who are hearing this talk, and especially the younger blood, youngsters and children who can actually start enacting these changes. The, and at the same time, let me give you a little example. Nudging is a, is a very unique concept which, which has been implemented in behavioral economics around the world. If I was to tell people in this room that you know you should donate your organs upon death, I, I'm sure that the subscription rates would be relatively low. But if we, if we make that option a default, that everyone who is born will donate their organs upon uh, death uh, to hospitals or whatever, and anyone can opt out. So I'm not taking away the freedom from anyone. Your freedom of choice remains there. You can opt out of that default option at any point in time but that suddenly jumps the subscription rates up. 
And this is, this is a very small example of nudging. Nudging is unique. So you can nudge yourselves in everyday life. You can nudge people around you. You can nudge your children. You can change your behaviors and your attitudes towards water. And also other resources, not just restricting it to water. So the way you see oil, crude oil, or fossil fuels, I think it's time we stop doing that and we shift our focus to those resources which are more important. Uh, such as water, because once it runs out, there will be no way back. So the whole concept is this concept of something called the tragedy of commons. We have created a tragedy for ourselves. So tragedy of commons was something which was, um, give a, a, which was built as a theory somewhere in, around the mid 19th century. Common grazing land was used by everyone. And since it was owned by all for use of all, no one took responsibility for it and everyone took their livestock on it. Since no one took responsibility, eventually these grazing common lands, they started deteriorating in quality and they finished off and the greener patches were nowhere to be found. This was something which happened in Britain. This was something which happened to some extent in Europe as well. The 21st century tragedy of the commons is water and we are not realizing it. We will probably realize it. That is a prediction, maybe 20, 30 years down the road. But for countries like Pakistan, if we do that, say by 2050, we realize, oh yes, we've created a tragedy of the commons for ourselves, I think it would be too late. So I'm going to leave you on this thought that the next time you step into a shower, the next time you fill your water bottle, or even your fuel tank, I want you to think about water, how you use it, how you have been using it, and how you're going to use it in the future, and whether your use and your attitude can make a difference. And perhaps all of you should also start teaching youngsters, children around you to start embedding these sorts of narratives and thinking, because this is the time to change our attitudes to a resource that is absolutely critical and essential to our lives, even if you're not realizing it at that stage. Uh, our energy crisis, Pakistan's food, impending food problems, sometimes with crops, our urban water issues, Islamabad as a city is running out of water. There is a huge uh, proposal of spending nearly $1.2 billion to bring in water from reservoirs such as Tarbela and Mangra. But the question is, we are still imagining that all this water will be available for long-term use, which we need to stop for a moment, think about it, and move ahead into the future. So I hope I leave you some, uh, with some food for thought and this is going to keep you preoccupied for a couple of days. Thank you.